Amen. Well, Abraham, thank you. That was a, a very kind welcome. I'm not quite sure about the man God's uh, made me to be, but he's trying. Um, as my mother-in-law's email says, he's not finished with me yet, so uh, hopefully <laughs> he's going to get there. Um, tonight we're looking at something that you probably feel you know backwards if you've ever been to Sunday school, which is the parable of the lost sheep. I must have told this story a gazillion times, and the, and the follow-on parables of the coin and the two sons as well. In fact, I've probably had some of you barring at the front here acting out uh, being a sheep. Uh, I won't be doing that tonight because I want to try and get this to go beyond. Yeah, you know, Sam, it was going to be you, don't you? Um, I, I, I want to try and get it beyond the Sunday school level. I just hands up if you ever went to Sunday school. Everyone to Sunday school? Everyone heard the story of the lost sheep? Yeah, bah, it's got lost. Jesus goes and saves it. Okay, so we're going to ask some of the questions of these passages and these chapters that get us a little bit deeper into it. So if you think you already know the answer, uh, it might not be Jesus. So, uh, so wait, wait for it and see what happens. In fact, to understand Luke 15, which is the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and of the two sons, or perhaps the three sons, we'll come on to that, a parable of the three sons, you need to understand uh, chapter 14 first. So turn with me to page 1047 in the church Bibles. If you need one, uh, they're at the back there. Um, 1047, and what we do is we find that Jesus is going to visit some of the religious hierarchy of his day, which were called the the Pharisees, well done. And he's there with them on a Sabbath, and they've invited him to eat with him. And the question is, have they welcomed him home? And, and the answer is really they haven't, because if you, you ever had one of those welcomes into someone's home where it really wasn't a welcome. <laughs> I mean, I would tell you the one about uh, going to uh, see my in-law when I was going to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, but <laughs> I won't do that one now. That was, a, that was, that was tougher. And what I will do is tell you uh, the lovely story Nicola told at the APCM, and I just saw it on the minutes uh, uh, there, and, and this, is, this is what she said at the APCM, the annual church broker meeting. Uh, she reflected that her best welcome was when she and Richard, plus three young children, uh, all aged under four, arrived in Chiswick uh, 11 and a half years ago, tired and totally exhausted. They stayed with Richard's aunt, who has five children of her own, but greeted them with a smile and sent Richard and Nicola to bed, where they slept for six hours while she looked after their children. (laughs) Now, that's an amazing welcome home, isn't it? What Jesus gets in chapter 14 is not a welcome home. He gets a grilling. (laughs) He gets a job interview. Are you good enough to be our Messiah? They want to know, is it lawful to eat on the Sabbath? Uh, They they want to ask him uh, and so forth. And he tells them a story about a lost ox that falls into a well or a lost child that falls into a well. And uh, and he asks, will you go and save it? And they can't say anything to him. And then he notices that in their house, they're all trying to jostle for position. They're trying to work out who gets to sit in the nicest places. And he says, don't try and sit in the nicest places, sit in the rubbish seat. Sit in the back row and you might get welcome forward, Siobhan. Great, great idea there. You might get welcome to the front row, uh, to the expensive seats up the front here, uh, next, uh, next to Abraham. He's, uh, you know, he's kept, kept, kept an entire row to himself <laughs> in the front. That's what Jesus says. Well, wait to be welcome forward. Uh, and then he says, you know, why not bring in the, the poor, the crippled, and the blind? And, and then they, one of them says, well, it's going to be great one day when we get welcomed home. That's uh, chapter 14, verse 15. It's going to be great one day when we get welcomed home. There's going to be a banquet in the kingdom of heaven. And isn't it going to be wonderful that we get welcomed home? And Jesus says, well, careful. Careful, Pharisees. You might not make the welcome. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, everything's ready, welcome home. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've bought a field and I must go, please excuse me. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, I'm on my way to try them out, please excuse me. Another said, I've just got married, I can't come. And there the servant goes back and says, no one wants to be welcomed home. Master, no one wants to be welcomed home. And the owner of the house gets angry and orders his servants to just go out and grab anyone, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And the servant says, we've done that, but there's still room. And he says, well, go even further. 
go to the utterly destitute on the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in, tell them they're welcome to home. But none of those who were first invited who are welcome to home are going to make it. And then Jesus says some things about the cost of discipleship, which uh, will fit to chapter 15. But chapter 15 begins with tax collectors and sinners just flocking to Jesus. They're like, this guy's welcoming us home. In fact, what the Pharisees say about them is, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. The idea is that Jesus has become the host at a banquet. Maybe he's taken over someone else's table. Maybe they're thinking about the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000. But he keeps welcoming people to his home. And the people who know that they're lost are really attracted to this. If you heard that expression, you've got to get to the end of your rope. <laughs> You've got to get to the end of your rope. Um, obviously, it could be a terminal position, but uh, the, the idea is that when you just can't do it on your own anymore, or have you heard about when, when someone's swimming and they start drowning, what you have to let them do is get to the point where they're not struggling anymore, don't you? If you've, if you've done that lifeguard training when they're at school, you know, where you have to jump in a swimming pool and your trousers on, <laughs> and they're like, what you've got to do is wait for them to stop struggling, because if they're struggling, they'll sink you and them. But when they know they can't cope anymore, when they can't save themselves, then they can be saved. They can be welcomed back to the shore. They can be welcomed home. The tax collectors, the sinners, know that they need a welcome. They know they need welcoming home. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who wouldn't welcome Jesus properly into their home, who just gave him a grilling, they're going, what on earth's going on here? Why are you welcoming these people in? Why are you polluting your home with these sinners, with these lost people? So the question we get from verses 1 and 2 is, who is lost anyway? And we're going to see it's dramatically answered at the end of the chapter, because what we have is, is three stories that run together. We're going to focus most of our attention tonight on these two, and I think next week we'll be looking at the parable of the three sons, the parable of the three sons, but uh, let me just take you to the punchline. The punchline is that son number two uh, is, is the one who runs off and becomes the prodigal. Son number one is the one who thinks he's all right, actually, <laughs> and it's everyone else's problem. And at the end of the chapter 15, this is the only character who we don't know if he's been welcomed home yet, except for our mystery question mark people. There's only, there's only the mystery question mark people and son number one who we don't know if they've made it home. So let's look at the people who do make it home. Firstly, the sheep. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Okay, do you, you hear that verse? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now, if I asked you who is the good shepherd in this parable, who would you say the answer was? Abraham? Jesus? Ah, well, there you are. But he doesn't sound particularly good in that verse, does he? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and he loses one of them. Have a look at the next parable. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Again, she doesn't sound like that good, does she? And the answer to this is actually there are, there are two different types of shepherds and two different types of, of women in this parable. And they, he quickly flips from one. Because in verses one and two, we have our Pharisees and teachers. And these people are supposed to uh, look after something. They're supposed to look after the lost sheep of Israel, God's people. And yet you'll remember the story of the lost sheep. Uh, it goes way back into the Old Testament, doesn't it? Can you remember where it starts? It starts in, in one of the great songs of the Old Testament. Which, which song does it start in, in the book of Psalms? The Lord is my, which is Psalm number it's the one from the Vicar of Dibley, Richard, but I can't remember which one it is. Number 23, that's right. Number 23, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in one. 
How does it go? He leads me by still waters. And then, the amazing next verse, and we've translated it in the King James Version, he restoreth my soul. He restores my soul, but it literally means he welcomes me home. He brings me home. So the good shepherd, which is God in Psalm 23, welcomes me home. And he prepares a table, doesn't he? He makes a table for me and hosts me in the presence of my enemies. That's God the good shepherd. By the time you get to the prophets, when things are going wrong for Israel, you get to Ezekiel uh, in particular. And this is when Israel is in a real mess. And in chapter 34... He, he writes the chapter that should be read out at every ordination service. And it's basically, you are the bad shepherds. And the punchline of it is you're devouring the sheep that you're supposed to be looking after. Instead of going after the, the lost and hurting people of Israel, you're just feeding off them, you're abusing them. Do you remember the, the story before uh, David's day of Samuel, uh, the prophet, and, uh, and his uh, his, his, his boss uh, was called Eli, and Eli's sons were just abusing the people when they came to bring sacrifices. And eventually, uh, God basically puts them to death, and, and Samuel's boss, Eli, falls over back and cracks his head open. Because one of the things God can't stomach is when uh, us in Christian leadership and ministry end up feeding off the sheep, because he's a good shepherd. And if we're devouring, the people we're supposed to be protecting, it's about as bad as it gets. So that's in Ezekiel. You'll get it also in Zechariah, I think also in Jeremiah. This sort of sense that God's leaders become the bad shepherds. And so when Jesus says, suppose one of you has a sheep, the first shepherd he's introducing into his story is the Pharisees. And he's saying what they would understand straight away. Suppose one of you is an Ezekiel 34 leader and you've let one of these precious sheep go. And he, he's kind, isn't he? I mean, elsewhere he's not that kind to them, but he's quite kind because sometimes you can be smacked around the face more by a, a gentle illusion than, a, than a, a full blow, can't you? The slap can sort of hurt you more inside than the punch. <laughs> and this is a slap saying, suppose one of you Pharisees has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. And he asks them the question he asked them in chapter 14. Wouldn't you go and get your ox or your child that's fallen into a well? Wouldn't you go after the last sheep until you find it? And the answer is, well, actually you haven't been. You haven't been going after these sinners and tax collectors who are coming to me. Why are they coming to me? Because you haven't been going after them. You're the bad shepherd. It's a really confrontational piece of writing here. You're the bad shepherd. But when the good shepherd, which is now him, finds the sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. He wants to celebrate with people that he's found his lost sheep. Now, a sheep was worth quite a lot of money. It was worth more than a day's wages. It was is a significant part of your investment. And a clear sense here is he's the owner of these sheep. He's not just a hired hand, he's the owner. But he wants to celebrate with people that he's found. But the punchline that comes in verses uh, six through eight is a surprising one. Now, why, why does he say that, that they'll be celebrating in heaven in the next verses? It's not necessarily what you think. It's not because I was able to find my sheep. It's not because uh, God is good and in heaven. The punchline is there will be more rejoicing over one sinner who repenteth than over 99 people who don't repent. In other words, something's happened with the sheep that he wants to celebrate. And the answer that he wants to celebrate is it repented. And you've got to think about it. And here I am tempted to act out the sheep thing just to wake you all up in this slightly darkened room. But I, but I won't because I promise. But there's the sheep. And, and what can it do? It's exhausted itself. It's gone wandering on the mountaintop until it's tired. It's been out all night. There are wolves and lions and things waiting to devour it. There are people who would steal it. What can it do to help itself? How can it be found? 
And the answer I read in a little story from the Middle East was a man who had lost his goat. And he said, we went to try and find our goat. And then we tried to communicate with the goat to get it back. So what did we say to the goat? Oh, I'll do a bad impression. We said, bah, to the goat. We said, bah. And we listened. Bah, 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 bah. They walked and walked and walked around the mountain for hours right through the night. Bah, bah. Oh, there, Abraham, Abraham can't help himself. He wants to be in the, in the show. Bah, came to the little goat. And do you know what they found? They found the mama goat lying on the hillside with her newly born kid um, suckling to her. And they picked her up and they took her back to the safety of the flock with her, with her little baby kid. <laughs> what could the goat do? She could listen to the voice and go, bah, I need help. And that was, I guess, her turning to her master saying, help, help, bah, help. In the next story, we have a lost coin. Now, to set this one up right, we have to remember the third story. And the third story is the story of the two sons, or as I said, the three sons. But it's also known as the story of the good father, isn't it? You're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's, that's sort of where that story comes from, that song comes from. So the third story is about the father. The first story is clearly about the son, Jesus, the good shepherd, uh, if you're going to wrap this up in a Trinitarian sort of way, help me out here. Who's the middle one likely to be about? Holy Spirit. Yeah, it's definitely got, there's definitely a good chance of it being about the Holy Spirit. It's definitely about Jesus. It's a good chance it's about the Holy Spirit. And who's the other woman who sort of appears in the New Testament in a metaphorical sort of way, not a literal way, a metaphorical way, a really, really key, important woman that runs right through Paul's letters in other parts of the New Testament, She's known as the bride. The church, yeah. Yeah, so the coin, the story of the lost coin, again, we've got a woman who is representing certainly Jesus, most likely the spirit of Jesus, and also quite possibly the church of Jesus, his bride. His bride. And this woman loses a coin that's worth a day's wages. And um, this isn't in any of the commentaries, but I'm going to throw this one out for you for free. What did God do in a day? A day's work for God. What was a day's work for God back in the book of Genesis? Give me an example. What did he do in just one day? He made the sun and the moon. Now, does the coin represent the sun and the moon, Sam? I'm going to go with no. Uh, what else did he do in a day? Let's advance on the sun and the moon. Come on, someone's read Genesis. Hey, who's, who's, who's done the Bible in one year and got to day three? Yeah? And yeah, if you've done a day three of the Bible in a year, then you know the answer. What does he do on the last day of creation before he has a nice rest? He makes humanity. A day's work for God in the Old Testament is making humanity. What does God want to go and seek and save? people, doesn't he? He doesn't want any of us to be lost. He wants to seek and search after humanity. So here is a woman who has lost a day's wage. She's lost a day's work and she's going and sweeping the house to search for it. You have to understand that these houses around Galilee are made of dark stone with a tiny slit window at the top, which was mainly so that the smoke could go out when they cook inside. It's a dark place. You have to light a lamp. You have to search around for it. And when she finds it, she's like, yes, and welcomes everyone into her home and says, look, I found that which is lost. The coin couldn't do much. It was a tenth of what she had. It couldn't do much to save itself. It couldn't do anything to save itself. And that, of course, is the same situation for us. We're not even just like the, the sheep who can go, bah. Fundamentally, we can't do anything until the Spirit comes and grabs us. We're dead, Paul says in Ephesians 2. We're doomed, we're depraved, we're damned until he comes and rescues us. We can't even make our own way home without him. Although there's an important response we have to make because again, it's repentance that they rejoice over. Do you know in the Old Testament, and here's uh, your final uh, non-Sunday school tip for the day. Um, there are many times 
moments, many times, where God is described as being angry, like in Luke 14, when he's angry that people won't be welcomed home. There are some times where he's described as compassionate, but the only time that God in heaven is described as joyful, that overflowing emotion that's so compelling, is when people like you and I turn back to him and say, sorry, could you welcome me home? It's the one thing that produces joy in God. It's the gift we can give our daddy in heaven, our mother spirit. It's the gift we can give is to say, I want to come back. Like a parent whose child's been away forever and uh, they're not expecting them and they come knocking on the door and they're like, suddenly they're like, oh! Abraham turns up. I'm, the, you know, I'm sure your parents don't feel like that at all because you're always turning up. But there, there are others of you where you're like, you know, if you go home, it's like, wow, <laughs> they've made it. They've made it. The joy of reconnection. And you have the potential tonight to give that amazing gift to your Father in heaven. You can bring joy to your Father in heaven by saying, please, will you welcome me home? And also, I want to welcome you home into my life tonight. So we're going to come to communion right now. And uh, before we do, I'm just going to solve this mystery here. Who is lost anyway in uh, Luke 15? And the answer is really clearly everyone except for son number three. Now, the tax collectors are lost, the sinners are lost, the Pharisees don't realise they're lost, but they're lost, like the, like the elder son. The only person who's not lost is son number three. And who's son number three in Luke 15? It's the guy telling the story, the son of God. And he's telling a story about his dad, he's telling a story about himself, he's telling a story about the spirit. And he's saying, I can save you. I can rescue you and I will pay whatever is necessary to welcome you home. I'll pay whatever is necessary to welcome you home. And here's a final verse. It's all about the cross and we're going to go straight into communion and worship after this. It says, for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, for the joy that he could see in the future, Christ endured the cross because when you repented, it brought joy to him. He hung on a cross for three hours, naked, whipped, battered and bruised because he knew that if you would come home, it would cause a party in heaven. He hung there and became sin for you. Is that not extraordinary? The only people, only people you don't really seem to benefit from this. Were the Pharisees and teachers who let their hearts grow hard. <laughs> Everyone else gets welcomed home. Friends, it's time to return to him as we take communion together now. And James is going to lead us.